Welcome to our weekly national news conference. I'm Sandy Close, uh, Director of Ethnic Media Services. Today, our focus is on the future of the Republican Party as seen by three newly elected GOP members, all from California, an overwhelmingly blue state where most African-American Latino and AAPI likely voters are Democrats, according to the Public Policy Institute. Some political observers and even former Republican elected officials believe the Republican Party has lost touch with diverse metropolitan areas. Our speakers today will share their views about the GOP's future and why they believe it offers the best representation for ethnic Americans. We so as one of the first Korean American women to ever serve in Congress and as a Republican, I believe that the Republican party to me is not the grand old party, but grand opportunity party. It works on policies that empower all Americans to achieve their American dream like I did. And that's exactly why I ran for Congress, to get through the gridlock and create common sense policies that help Americans succeed. And I think the fact that this freshman Republican class in Congress has so many women, many from minority communities, and many of us are veterans, it really shows that the future of the Republican Party is bright. So for the Republican Party to reach new voter, uh, voters, I truly believe, and I've always talked about how we need to show up and share our message that Asian Americans are not automatically considered to be a member of the Democratic Party. We have our voices, we have our shared values, we have our uh, conservative views. I think that is really important, but that is something that we have an obligation to uh, show up and uh, network with our uh, very uh, rich ethnic communities. And I think that's where uh, Assemblywoman Susan, uh, you know, Suzette uh, Martinez and uh, Councilman Walter, we also have that obligation to share that common goal. As communities across the country see faces that look like them and hear from new voices that sound like them, woman voices, minority voices, immigrant voices. You know, these are showing when you get big government policies out of the way and we work on lowering taxes, cutting regulations and red tape, create pro-growth policies that allow for meaningful job opportunities. I think this is how we will see Republicans continue to make an impact in our communities. Um, I do not want to move, but the policies in California are crushing the middle class and forcing us out of a state, out of a soil that ha we have reaped so much from to leave this state because of the economic policies and the lack of economic upward mobility for all Californians because of policies being implemented in Sacramento. As a new legislator, my priorities have been representing you know, the voice of my community, addressing wildfires, public safety power shutoffs, addressing, you know, um, lockdown and closures with little to no guidance from an administration that has mismanaged this lockdown, our vaccine rollout, our businesses um, at an alarmingly negligent pace. Um, it has been devastating and it is frustrating. And this is the pandemic. These issues, California's brand has been crisis prior to this pandemic. Homelessness, the lack of affordable housing, the high cost of living, taxes. Latino families literally have to drive until they can afford a home. Uh, when you say that the lockdown was mishandled, what would you have done differently? Yeah, you know, I think that um, on the ground, it's been amazing to see the resiliency of our community and our businesses who have done their part. You know, people stayed home from work, um, businesses closed their doors because government asked them to. But during this past year, even before I was in the state assembly, the administration has had little to no collaboration with the business community, with the legislature, 
with our public health departments. Um, and there has been little, little, little guidance. I introduced a bill um, uh, uh, in, uh, early in January, Assembly Bill 420, which is a safe theme park reopening. Because as theme parks, you know, I worked at Six Flags Magic Fountain, had had absolutely no guidance for business reopening since the onset of their closure and this pandemic. Why did we, why did our administration nearly a year later not provide guidance for so many industries that had been shuttered and closed for over a year? A clear mismanagement. Another clear mismanagement was that of EDD. EDD, 10 years ago during the first recession, the California auditor made recommendations because they knew had we been stuck in this situation again, where an enormous amount of people would need access to their EDD benefits, would not be able to get it had these fixes not um, been executed. They were not executed. And today we still have 1.2 million Californians that do not have and need their EDD benefits. At the end of the day, it's been the administration's responsibility oh, nearly a year and a half later to get that agency under control and delivering benefits to people. And lastly, the vaccine rollout was another uh, debacle. The administration again knew that we would have in November and December vaccines. That rollout should have been planned and executed. People died because of an ineffective rollout, which disproportionately affected the Latino community when it came to access to vaccines as well. Thank you, Assemblywoman. And let me point out that California has the highest percentage of vaccinations in the country. So uh, I find that people uh, in our communities, particularly in Covina, their major concern is quality of life and public safety. And one of the major concerns I have uh, as a local elected official is exactly that, public safety. And being in law enforcement for all of these years and currently the director of a police academy, uh, one of the major concerns I have, and I know many people have, and it doesn't make any difference whether you're Republican or Democrat, is the notion of defunding the police. And I, I wanted to just talk about that just for a quick minute. Uh, 21st century policing is supposed to be driven by crime data. And for some reason, many people don't pay attention to the data. Uh, it is the victims reports of crime uh, and issues that deal with crime that sends police disproportionately into communities of color. Uh, and for some reason, uh, people think that police officers, uh, and like I said, I've been around for a long time in the profession, really run around uh, making it their point to target uh, Blacks or Latinos. And that's simply not the case. I live this profession, I'm living it now, training young recruits from several di different departments in LA County. They send them to us, uh, 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 each year, we, we train these officers. The majority of the officers we're training at the academy that I supervise are minority. 80% of the class is minorities. It just so happens last year, I think the, uh, the number of black uh, 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 individuals that were shot by the police was somewhere around 235. Most of them were armed and dangerous. Unfortunately, from my perspective, being in the profession and being in the city, being on a city council, the way the it is portrayed is that police officers are shooting a black man every day of the year, and that's just not happening in terms of uh, killing a black man every year who is unarmed, and that's simply not the case. Uh, 